a pleasure to welcome back. It's been a while since we've had Rabbi Levine. As I mentioned, we're not doing really formal introductions, but the best service the rabbi, the Jewish Center on 86th Street in Manhattan, one of the most you know, prominent shuls in uh, in North America. And it's really a pleasure to welcome here I'm back, if I can say that. And uh Rabbi Levine. Thank you so much, Rabbi Kelman. Thank you for organizing this uh, very inspiring uh, program. And uh, thank you to all of the participants um, who are uh, who are here. Um, it's uh, inspiring uh, for me to know that so many of you at this uh, difficult time on Tisha B'Av afternoon have carved out the time to uh, to study Torah, and uh, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful Kiddush Hashem. The topic that uh, I want to uh, work on with you in the time that we have um, is a topic that I've called uh, "When the Halachic World Stops Turning: Rav Goren and the Curious Case of Mace Mitzvah." There's an extraordinary uh, phenomenon in, uh, in halacha that is unlike any other situation that, um, that, we, could possibly, uh, that we could possibly think of. And colloquially, we call this uh, a mace mitzvah. It's uh, difficult uh, to translate the uh, expression, but it's a situation in which a person discovers an unburied corpse, and the halacha requires him to stop what he's doing and devote all his attention uh, to burying the body. Okay, so just to get our feet wet and to introduce ourselves to this uh, to this concept, I want to share with you um, a, uh, a source from the uh, from the Beis Yosef um, that will help uh, um, just give us a little bit of a um, an introduction to uh, to what this mitzvah is uh, is all about, and it's stunning. Listen to the words of the Beis Yosef. He says, "Mates mitzvah zehu shenimtu baderach o ba'ir shel goyim ve'ein lo kovrim u'mimakom she matzu ein yachol likros Yisrael shiane ve'yavol itapel ba ula kavra." You discover this uh, this corpse, and uh, you're in a place where there's not a lot of other Jewish people around. You have no way to bring Jewish people to uh, to help uh, with the uh, with the burial. And um, the halacha is asur lo lazuz misham ulaniach asames afilu lelech laeir lahavi kovrim eli tame biatzmo vikbrenu. So, do not pass go. Stop everything that you're doing. Don't call for help. Just right then and there perform the mitzvah of burying this body. And now listen to these words. Stunning. Afilu hu kohen gadol v'nazir. He says, you, you could take this ad absurdum. You have a Kohen Gadol who's a Nazir. You have every reason in the world not to be Metame yourself. Those are people who are never allowed to become Tame. He's going to Shech the Korban Pesach. He's going to do a mitzvah sasi de Reisa. It's the eighth day. His wife just had a baby. He's about to perform Mila on his son. No, stop everything. The only thing that you could do in this situation is perform the mitzvah of kvura. And right away, it raises a kind of fascinating philosophical question, which is what do we owe the mace? What do we owe the person who is no longer in this world? When a person is in sold, I can have a relationship with them. He could make kiddish for me. I could make a kiddish for them. I could make them a promise. They could promise me something. I could owe him money. He could collect money for me. What are we saying about our relationship to a person who's just a body and their soul has left this world? Now, this topic is actually, uh, it's not complicated, but it actually creates something of a conundrum for people who are interested in it because the sources for this uh, mitzvah and this sugya are scattered all, uh, all over Shas and they don't appear in just, uh, in just one place. So what I'd like to do with you in the time that we have together is gather together these, uh, uh, these sources and attempt to shed a little light on this extraordinary phenomenon, which is totally sui generis. I'm not aware of any other case like this, where we basically say the whole halachic world stops turning, and the only thing that you can do in this moment is perform this obligation. Okay, and we're going to move from Tanakh to the Gemara and the Medrash to Rishonim and Achronim, and my goal is to understand where these halachos come from, what they actually mean, 
what's behind them. And finally, um, in the time that, uh, that, that is allowed, how they play out in practice. And I specifically want to focus on uh, the extraordinary efforts of Rav Shlomo Goren with respect to this, uh, to this, special, uh, to this special mitzvah. Okay, so um, I'll just share, I'll try not to share the sources too often because I prefer to be able to, uh, to see you, but uh, in, in some uh, moments, I'm going to, uh, to share a screen and just take a look at some of these sources uh, together. So the Pasuk in Vayikra, Perak Chafalif uh, tells us some of the halachos of who's allowed to uh, be metame mace, who's allowed to defile themselves when uh, you have a, a corpse. We know that a Kohen is not permitted to become Tamei with the exception of a immediate relative. If one of the seven Krovin passes away, then the, the, uh, the Kohen can become uh, Tamei. But it seems to be an extra, uh, an extra pasuk, which probably could have done without. And uh, based on that pasuk in source number three, the Gemara derives that uh, not only can a Kohen be mitame to a mace in the case of an immediate relative, but also he can and must be mitame to the mace in the case of a mace mitzvah. Okay, and you can see this in the Torah in source number four. Kishem shemetam lekrovim kach metam lemeis mitzvah vefilu hu kohen gadol benazir vehalach lishchot es pischov lemulis beno matzah meis mitzvah metam lo. So that, uh, uh, as we saw in the Beis Yosef, comes directly from this formulation in the uh, in the Torah. Okay. So just um, take one more uh, one more cue. Um, I like to um, make a lot of trouble at the beginning and then uh, work our way toward uh, a solution. So just notice one further oddity about the halachos of meis mitzvah. The Torah writes in source number five, mm-hmm. 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 It's so a fascinating uh, aspect to this, uh, to this halacha, which is um, you don't have to get permission from the person who owns the field. Even if they object, if the, if the mace mitzvah is buried in their property, even without their knowledge, they have no right to uh, exhume the body or to, uh, to transfer the body. Um, all bets are off. And uh, we have this halacha that the mace is kober meko, is kone mekomo, the place where the, the uh, body is buried is forever, um, let's say, uh, owned um, by, the, uh, uh, by the body that was buried. Uh, that was buried. Okay. Now, once you see the formulation of the, uh, of the Ramban in source number six, so there's really no going back. And uh, uh, he says explicitly, may smitzvah kodem, Okay, so I have it for you in the Hebrew, in the English. Performing this mitzvah, uh, mitzvah comes before everything else. Take your pick. The study of Torah, the temple service, reading the Megillah, it overrides the prohibition of Tuma relating to the Kohen or a Nazir. It's going to come before the mitzvah of Korban Pesach or Bris Milah. In the entirety of the Torah, nothing takes precedence over Mes Mitzvah. So if we just had this Ramban uh, saying we, we would have to, um, we, we would have to uh, just stop and, and wonder. Right. What could it possibly be? And shouldn't we all know about this? I'm saying we're basically being told, uh, forgive me if, uh, if this sounds a little too, uh, too extreme, but this is the most important thing in the world. Right? If we start to compare it to anything else, nothing takes precedence over May Smith's. Okay, so we have to grapple with this and we have to come to terms with why this should be that uh, Mace Mitzvah, uh, of all the possible mitzvahs in the Torah, is going to take precedence over anything, over anything else. Okay. So I, I hope the question is, uh, is clear. I think it, uh, it begs our attention and requires us to pause and consider just what's at stake here 
and why mace mitzvah would be accorded so much uh, supremacy in the rank ordering of uh, priorities when it comes to how to live our, uh, our Jewish lives. And even if, you know, let's say most of us in the 21st century will not have an opportunity to perform a mace mitzvah because, uh, you know, we live in communities where people are not, uh, people are not alone and we have uh, Hatzalah and we have all kinds of ways to, uh, to deal with people and identify people. Understanding where this comes from, the values behind it will shed a great deal of light on how we relate to people who have left this world, which of course is appropriate to think about on the day when we commemorate and mourn all the losses of Jewish life over the course of Jewish history. Okay, so let's dig a little deeper. Just how does this work? What's the mechanism by which we can explain and maybe even say how we can justify why mace mitzvah would be accorded so much, uh, so much weight. Okay, so just to keep things in perspective, it's important to remember um, that burial, forgetting the case of mace mitzvah specifically, but just say a normal case of uh, someone who dies in the normal course of things, and they have relatives, we know who they are, and there's lots of opportunities to uh, um, make sure that we do all the chesed that we need to do after a person's passed away. So what's the source in the Torah that tells us we need to perform the mitzvah of Kura? So the Torah tells us in... Um, this is source number seven. Stunning to recognize that the mitzvah of not delaying a burial comes from the execution of someone who has committed a capital offense. The Torah tells us that when one has committed a capital offense and been put to death by the based in, you're not allowed to just uh, leave their body uh, hanging. Right away, you have to go ahead and bury the corpse. And again, this is the ad absurdum case. This is someone who violated the worst uh, offenses in the Torah, such that they were put to death by the court. And that person is nonetheless accorded the dignity of Jewish burial and expeditious Jewish burial. There can be no delay. Kikilas Elohim Talui. And we'll have to come back and unpack the deeper meaning of that expression, but somehow there's going to be some terrible problem, some curse that uh, is unleashed in the absence of expeditious burial. And not just that, don't defile, don't pollute the land by allowing a corpse to go unburied. So let me share with you a, um, a comment of the, uh, the Shagas Aryeh. Again, we're jumping to the Achronim, um, but we'll jump back to, uh, to earlier sources. So he wants to understand you know, our question, why this, uh, uh, why this should be. Why it is that uh, Mace Mitzvah uh, has so much uh, precedence when compared to any other obligation. So he helps us get the ball rolling. He says in the bold, in source number eight, Kilomar, ha-meshem mitzvah al kol adam l'kavro b'amro k'vor t'ikbarenu adka. So the first thing you have to understand is based on the pasuk we just saw from Devarim Perak Chav Aleph, there's a mitzvah on every person to make sure that anytime someone has died, the burial is performed. It's not like, oh, it falls onto the family members or the Hebrew Kaddish. No, it's the responsibility of every Jew to make sure that any Jew who's passed away is buried properly and expeditiously. And if someone fails to perform that mitzvah, then the mitzvah applies the next day and the day after that. It never goes away. There is always a standing obligation to make sure that someone who's passed away is given dignity in burial. If you fail to do it, so you violated the mitzvah saseh, there's 248 uh, you know, uh, positive commandments, affirmative commandments in the Torah. One of them is to perform expeditious burial. If you didn't do it, you didn't do it. But that doesn't mean the mitzvah doesn't apply the next day. It applies until the burial is complete. It applies indefinitely until someone has taken care of this obligation to make sure the deceased is buried, the mitzvah never goes away. 
So now the Shagasari begins to give us a bit of halachic vocabulary to be able to confront the issue which we find so vexing. There's an important halachic principle which says that when you have an affirmative mitzvah that comes in competition with a negative mitzvah, the affirmative mitzvah will override it. The assay is docha the los assay. So now we can at least begin to understand. You encounter this, uh, uh, this corpse. Well, now it activates. The red lights uh, go off. The sirens go off. It activates its mitzvah, assay, which says you need to bury this person expeditiously. And that is going to override any, uh, uh, any los assay. You know, the Losa say, says, uh, don't steal the field from your friend and take up his field with uh, someone else's stuff. No, that gets pushed aside. You don't have to worry about that because the principle in front of you says you have an affirmative mitzvah to bury this corpse. Okay, so that gets us halfway home. We could understand how this could over, override a mitzvah's Losa say. But what about the sources that we've just seen that this is going to take precedence over other Mitzvos say, Who's to say? I have a bris mila to perform on my son. It's also a pasuk that says I have to perform mila on the eighth day. So who's to say that this meis mitzvah comes before that? It's Erev Pesach. I'm trying to shech the Pesach, the carbon Pesach. So who's to say that this mitzvah takes prior? Why? So jump to the uh, to the next bolded section at the end of source number eight. Masha ein kain midedachi kuras meis mitzvah le Pesach umila. The Shagasari says something very, uh, very important, and we'll see the basis for it in a second. He says, you know, all things being equal, it would be a stalemate. If you told me you have the mitzvah of performing a bris on your son and performing a, a kfura on a body, you never even saw them before. So that's just two competing mitzvahs. There's nothing to say that one should take precedence over the other. You'd have to work that through. Why does the mitzvah of mace mitzvah, why does the mitzvah of kfura suddenly override every other, why does it win every competition against any other mitzvah? So he answers the question by telling us that it's not just a regular mitzvah saseh, but it's a mitzvah saseh that is a trumped up mitzvah saseh, a super mitzvah saseh, because it contains within it an added element called kavod habrios. Kavod habrios. And we'll have to unpack what this means, but the mitzvah is to give dignity and respect to every, and let's just fill in the blank, human being, and in this case, we're going to say alive or dead, right? Normally, I would say kavod brios. What are brios? Brios are other living creatures or other people. But in this case, we're saying that kavod brios applies even to a person who is no longer alive. Okay. So where did the Shagasari get this from? Let's learn a, a Gemara together, a, a Gemara that comes from the very beginning of uh, Masechus Megillah. Source number nine, Ba'i Rabba, Mikra Megillah Mesvitzvah Haiminayu Adif. So the Gemara is a question. One second. There's a Mace Mitzvah and there's Mikra Megillah. So which one comes first? Which one comes first? How do you prioritize? Mikra Megillah Adif Mishum Pirsu Minisa. Odilma Mace Mitzvah Adif Mishum Kavod Abrios. So each one has some special element. Mikra Megillah has this element of Pirsu Minisa. We publicize the nace that Hashem performed for the Jewish people in the time of Queen Esther. That makes it a very special kind of mitzvah. It's not just, uh, you hear the Megillah. No, it's a mitzvah and it contains Pirsu Menisa. O Dilma, Meis Mitzvah, Adif Mishum, Kabra Brius, or maybe Meis Mitzvah should take precedence because Meis Mitzvah speaks to another indispensable ethic, namely the ethic of Kavod Habrius. Basu Devaya Hadi Pashta, the Gemara asked the question, the Gemara answered the question, Meis Mitzvah, Adif. The meis mitzvah comes first. Amar mar gadol kavod abrios shadochas lo sasei shebatara. The meis mitzvah is going to come first because kavod abrios is such a valuable and such an indispensable virtue that it will even override a lo tasei in the in the Torah. So 
we're, we're halfway home. We started by asking, why would it be that mace mitzvah burying a person, you never saw them before, you don't know them, you don't have a relationship to them, it's just that there's a corpse, and the corpse needs to be buried. Why does this become such a super mitzvah that the whole halachic world stops turning? It's going to take precedence over any other mitzvah. Kavod habrius. Kavod habrius makes the notion of kfura a much greater and more urgent mitzvah than any other mitzvah that we could think of to, uh, to compete with. So Karban Pesach and Bris Mila, they're all going to pale in comparison because those mitzvahs contain no aspect of Kavod Abrios, and Kavod Abrios is so important that it's going to make this mitzvah of burying the, the, the corpse the most important thing before us. So I say we're halfway home because what I've really just done is put different words to the same equation. I'm saying mace mitzvah is more important because it's more important. It's more important because it's kavod abrios. Mm, okay, so tell me now, what is kavod abrios? I've just kicked the question you know, down the road. I've just kicked the can down the road. So I'm now saying mace mitzvah is the most important because kavod abrios is the most important. Well, what's kavod abrios and why is kavod abrios certainly and suddenly more important than any other, than any other mitzvah? Let's learn, um, let's learn a, uh, a couple of sources uh, uh, together. First, a min chaspinoch, and then a, uh, and then a rashi. And it comes back to that uh, case that I mentioned a few moments ago, where someone's committed a capital offense, they're put to death by the based in, and now the Torah tells us, irrespective of the fact that they were the worst criminal in the world, and that they did terrible things, nonetheless, they have to be granted dignity in burial, and they have to be buried properly and expeditiously. So listen to what the Sefer Achinuch says about this, uh, about this mitzvah. So the, uh, the Sefer Achinuch writes, why do you have to uh, bury someone uh, right away and not leave them? So the Pasuk itself said, Ki elokim talui, because to leave them hanging would be to somehow hang Hashem, it's a funny formulation. So what does the Sefer Achinuch say? Ki kilas elokim talui, the bold in source number 11, kilomar, that's to say, shalom yomar habrius mipnei mazet talui, mipnei shekilel es Hashem. People will start uh, chattering, and they'll say, why was this person executed? We see a, a corpse. It must be that they cursed Hashem, and that's why they were executed. V'nimtza b'haskiram zev, halosam adavar b'fiyam, shehem achalim shem shemayim, v'gomlim ra'al enafshem. People are going to start telling the story of the reason why this person was executed. What did they do that was so bad that they were guilty of a capital offense? Let me tell you what the capital offense was. And they start talking about the fact that this person cursed Hashem. And why did they curse Hashem? And then you end up having a whole conversation about people cursing Hashem. We don't want that. So we want to make sure to make uh, to make sure that the uh, that the corpse doesn't generate this uh, terrible chatter which will end up desecrating the name of Hashem, make sure that the burial happens right away. But listen now to how Rashi explains this expression, kikilas elokim talui, in a very different way. Rashi says, the amazing Rashi, kikilas elokim talui. So what does that mean? Zilzulo shel melechu. It is a degradation, a disgrace of the king. I'll tell you why Rashi says. To leave a buried, uh, to leave a body unburied disgraces the name of Hashem. We always say, because the Torah tells us, that Hashem is our father, we are Hashem's children, and we are created in the divine image. He says, let me explain. I'll give you a mashal. I'll give you a parable. Mashal l'shnei achim te'omim. Shayudomim zelazeh. Let's just say, for argument's sake, that you had twin brothers, identical twins. Echad nasa melach v'echad nipas the listios v'nisla. One became a king, and one became a bandit who was caught and eventually hanged. Kol ha-roe asa omer ha-melech talui. Anyone who sees that uh, uh, that brother hanging will say, oh, the king has been hanged. No, no, it's not him. 
it's the twin brother, but people will mistake one for the other because they're identical. Rashi says it's the same thing with the relationship between Hashem and human beings. When the language of the Torah is uh, is klala is kilkel, it's telling you that something has been made light. It's the opposite of the word kaved. Something that should be heavy is in fact is in fact made light. We have the same idiom in English. Don't make light of something. No, it's serious. Rashi is telling us that to leave the image of a human being, whoever they may be, unburied, disgraces the image of God, because at the end of the day, we have to remember that every human being is created in the image of God. And so this microcosm of God, to treat the microcosm of God with indignity, is to treat Hashem with indignity. Now, I want to share with you a Ramban that takes this uh, even further, but to get to the Ramban, let's learn a Gemara together in source number 13. Again, we're trying to understand the force of Kavod Abrios and why, why we have to care so much about this ethic, this value called Kavod Abrios that we need to stop the entire halachic world to bury someone, lest someone see an unburied body. Source number 13. The Gemara says, I have a question for you. A fascinating philosophical question. You know, hopefully it doesn't come up in, uh, in practice, but a fascinating philosophical question. Let me just understand the Gemara says, what is the purpose of burial? Is the purpose of burial because we want to make sure that there's no bizayon, that there's no indignity that uh, uh, we inflict upon the, the corpse? Or is it because of kapara? Somehow the act of burial will serve as an atonement for the deceased. The Gemara says, like, what's writing on this? What, what, what does it matter? Why are we asking this question? You bury a person, whatever the reason. So the Gemara says, no, no, it, it matters. We need to get to the bottom of this. We need to know the rationale behind it. I'll give you an example. What if someone says, it's not for me. I don't want to be buried. What would we do? If the issue is that the sight of an unburied corpse is considered to be a degradation, an abomination, an indignity, well, then we can't listen to him. That's not his decision. But if it's about atonement, so maybe it is his decision. At the end of the day, he says, I'm not interested. I don't want atonement. Whatever happens to me in the afterlife happens to me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm good with it. I'm going to let it go. Well, if it's about Kapara, then it's his decision and, and we can't override it. So we need to get to the answer. We need to get to the bottom of this. Why are we burying someone? Is it about Bizayon or is it about Kapara? So now let's learn this from Ban in source number 14. Ramban writes the following. He quotes our Gemara, and then he says, uh, four lines from the bottom, He says, you know, this is an unresolved question in the Gemara, but it's a suffix deraisa. And a suffix deraisa, we have to be machmir. We can't just let it go. There's some doubt as to how to resolve this. We have to be machmi, we have to be stringent, we have to bury the person, even if they said, I don't want it, don't bury me. Now here's the key part. Let's say someone dies, there's no, there's no relatives, there's no one to bury them. And the person has attached to the, to the corpse. There's a living will and testament. He says, if you find me, don't bury me. What do you do? Ain shaman. Disregard his wishes. It was his last wish. It was his last will and testament. Too bad. There's a higher value. There's a higher ethic. We're not going to listen. Why? If you remember one thing from this year, remember this line from the Ramban. De biziona de kulhu chaye kamrina. The absence of burial of one 
person constitutes an affront to every living human being. It can't be. It can't be that we allow a corpse to go unburied. It's an affront, not just to that person, not just to their family, not just to their community, to all humankind. What an arresting formulation. It's the opposite of what Rashi said. Rashi said to not bury the person is an affront to Hashem. The Ramban is saying to not bury someone is an affront to all humankind. It's an affront to all people. It's an affront to life itself. In the early days of the Yishuv, Rabbi Ben-Sion, Mayor um, Chaim Uziel, who was eventually the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel, was asked whether medical students could perform autopsies. Very important question. Cook was asked the same question. Ultimately, he allowed them. But I just want to share with you a formulation from his tshuva that he wrote, allowing the performance of autopsies to be able to study medicine. It wasn't because uh, we had some pressing need. It was just uh, to learn so that doctors could understand anatomy and could understand no substitute for, uh, for uh, autopsy on a human cadaver. What he was contending with was the following. He writes, Look at this beautiful formulation. It says, the prohibition against desecrating a body is predicated on the notion that doing so is a disgrace to all living things, the Ramban. That is to say, it's a disgrace to leave a person created in the image of God and gifted with reason and understanding whose role it is to steward and rule all creations lying on the streets to rot and decompose. This is the highest, greatest creation in the whole of uh, the whole uh, creation story is humankind. Is a human being, you can't leave them. There's no distinction, he writes. Ain Hebdel, Ben Goyli Israel, Ben Chayve Misa Olav. Doesn't matter who they are, Jew, Gentile, capital punishment, biggest tzaddik, doesn't matter. No one can say, I forego it, I waive it, I don't need to be buried, I don't want it, I don't care. No one can say that. You're a human being, and by virtue of being a human being, you represent humanity. And to leave a human corpse unburied is an affront to all human kind. This is the first approach that I want to share with you, the answer to our question as to why it would be that the halachic world stops turning in the face of the Mes Mitzvah. And now I want to share with you a second approach, which dovetails with the first and is maybe even complementary to the first. There's an amazing, uh, there's an amazing medrash um, in the interest of time, we'll just learn it in the, uh, in the English, but you'll have it on the source sheet if you want to go back and study it later. The Pasuk says, When your brother falters, you have to help them. So the Medrash says, what's the case of your brother who falters, that you have to help them? Okay. So what's intended by, uh, uh, by, that, uh, by that expression? So the, the Medrash applies to this case, the Pasuk in Tehillim, Ashrei Maskil Eldal Biyom Ra'i Malte. Blessed is the one who has regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in their times of trouble because they help the one who was in need. Who's that a reference to? The person who comes to the, the aid uh, of, the, uh, of the weak, of the destitute. Mayor said it refers to one whose inclination for good conquers its rival. E.C. said that it refers to one who gives a coin to the pauper. Rabbi Yochanan said it refers to one who buries the abandoned corpse. It refers to our case of May Smitzvah. We're going to apply this pasuk, Ashrei Maskil Eldal Biyam Ra'imote. The proof that the Medrash cites, and this is going to be a hint, this is going to be a clue for us, is the pasuk from Tehillim, Yushar Ba'aretz, the very next line. You can see it in source number 17. Ashrei maskil el dal biyom ra'im al tehu Hashem. Okay, blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. 
Hashem Yishmerehu Biachayehu, Hashem protects them and preserves them. Ve'ushar ba'aretz bi'altid neu benefesh oibat. They're counted among the blessed of the land. Now, you might think you don't have to pay close attention. We understand the idea that this is someone who's uh, performed a good act and Hashem saves them, but there's something very specific about the kind of good act that they performed. They're counted among the blessed of the land. And this I want to begin to suggest is the second approach to understanding why Mace Mitzvah is so important and so central and takes precedence over so many other mitzvahs in the Torah. There's another, uh, there's another Gemara in Meseches Smachos, which I'll just share with you in source number, uh, source number 20, that highlights the degree to which someone needs to bury the person right where they're found. Okay? And uh, we, we, said, um, uh, we said the Kina about the Asara Haruge Malchus today, and we think a lot today about Rabbi Akiva, and, uh, and his optimism, there's an amazing Gemara about Rabbi Akiva and Mace Mitzvah. And Rabbi Akiva uh, told the following story. I'll just summarize it for you in source number 20. He says, when I first started becoming uh, involved with the sages, um, I, I was just on my path. And remember, Rabbi Akiva had been a shepherd and he didn't know much. So he was just getting acclimated to the ways of Torah Mitzvah. So he says, I got up one day and I found uh, Mes Mitzvah. And what did I do? I took the, the corpse and, and I, I took it with me for, uh, you know, uh, down the road until I found a place where there were people to help me with the burial and I buried the Mes Mitzvah. And, um, and I came to the base Medrash and I said, you know, I did such a special mitzvah today. I buried a Mes Mitzvah. I found him and I took him and I, I moved him off the road and I, I gave him a proper burial. And the, and the rabbi said, no, Rabbi Akiva, you made a mistake. You shouldn't have taken him anywhere. Mes mitzvah means you bury the person on the spot in exactly the place where they are found. There's an amazing Ibn Ezra, which um, tells us that there's another dimension to this notion of mes mitzvah. It's not about the disgrace to human beings, as the Ramban said this vision of the unburied body. It's not a disgrace to humankind. It's rather a disgrace to the land in which the body should have been buried. Listen to the words of the Ibn Ezra in source number 21. But first, just go back to source number seven. Once you see it, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, right? There are two, two aspects that the, that the Pasuk told us about the, the primacy of Jewish burial. Verse 23, Make sure you don't leave the body uh, hanging, bury it right away. As we talked about, as Rashi and Ramban explained, either it'll be a, a chil Hashem or it'll be disgrace to all humankind. And then the, 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 the Pasuk adds another line, which we read, but maybe read too quickly. And the Ibn Ezra is going to seize on it. He says, don't leave the corpse unburied because so doing defiles the land that Hashem has given to you. Below source number 21, you have to understand the context. This is when the Jewish people go out to war to conquer the land. You have to understand that burying the Jewish corpse, burying any corpse, is a kavod not to the deceased, but a kavod to the land. He says, this is what differentiates us. This is what distinguishes us from other cultures and from other pagan societies. They have all, all sorts of other burial practices and you know, I actually did a little research into Canaanite uh, burial practices. It was totally inconclusive because there were dozens of different tribes spanning a whole host of eras, eras with, uh, you know, each with its own unique practice, some buried in pits or in caves. There was no way to know what the Ibn Ezra had exactly in mind, but clearly burial as we know it was a uniquely Jewish practice 
on this reading, the unburied corpse desecrates the land, and the land cannot abide. So the Torah enjoins us on its behalf. There would be no distinction, as we'll see, between Jew and non-Jew. It's not about the deceased. It's about protecting the sanctity of the land. It's not too much in a halachic sense. It's more in the spiritual sense, as you could see in sources number 23 or 24. Sometimes the Torah tells us that defilement or tuma is not literal, but figurative. And that's what the Torah is worried about, should a, a, a human being not be buried in the earth. I would say the following formulation. The earth is meant to be a source of life. And the site, and I think this is the key word, the site of an unburied body is incongruous, is incongruous with the life-giving nature of the land. So we have two competing, and I want to say hopefully complementary approaches to the magic of mace mitzvah. Maybe it's a kind of super mitzvah because Kavod Brios elevates it above the normal status of a mitzvah saseh. Or maybe it's tied to the land. To leave a corpse unburied is to violate the life-giving nature of the land itself. Now, in the time that uh, we have remaining, I want to examine just one or two implications of what we've been talking about by examining a couple of practical issues that the post can raise with respect to Mace Mitzvah, and we'll come to Reb Goren in just, uh, uh, in just a moment. Okay. So the, uh, the first question, the first question that I would, uh, would ask, and in the interest of time, I'll just summarize some of these, uh, these sources. Does the mitzvah that we've been talking about apply anywhere, or is it specific to the land of Israel? On the first approach, according to the Ramban, according to Rashi, it would seem that uh, this notion of mace mitzvah is not place dependent. Wherever there's a mace mitzvah, the risk of leaving a, bury, uh, an, a body unburied is to risk an affront to all humankind and to all, uh, to all creations, Jew, non-Jew, anywhere, anytime, any place. But on the second reading, according, according to the Ibn Ezra, not burying a body is not an affront to the body, but an affront to the land. The, the, the human being has to be returned to the land, the land which is a source of life. It can't be seen as a source of death. And so on that reading, according to the Ibn Ezra, it would seem that the mitzvah of mace mitzvah applies exclusively if the person's body is found in the land of Israel. I'll just share with you something fascinating, which is that the Ramban, even though he seemed to be championing the first approach, was not oblivious to the second. And you could look in source number 29. I'll just share without sharing the screen. He says, So there's a second component. It's twice the Aveira if someone fails to perform the mitzvah of mes mitzvah in the Holy Land, in the land of Israel, there is something special about the observance of this mitzvah in, uh, in Israel. Now, what about the case of a, uh, what about the case of a non-Jew? So you could understand how there might be a distinction between a Jewish corpse and a, uh, and a non-Jewish corpse. And um, I'll just share with you this amazing, uh, this amazing story. Um, in 19, uh, 1948, there were uh, Jewish casualties in the War of Independence, and there were soldiers who um, never came home. They never came home alive, and they never came home not alive. Their, their bodies were, were missing. Soldiers had seen them fall in the battlefield. We could establish beyond the shadow of a doubt that they'd been killed in battle, but their bodies were missing. 1950, there was a man named Avraham Shvat who was searching for his son. He had a son who had been killed in the Galil, and tragically, a second son killed near Janine, what was then Jordan and the body had never been recovered almost two years 
since the War of Independence. There was a, a special um, uh, commission that was uh, set up to uh, to deal with these uh, to deal with these issues. Um, it was a council for soldiers commemoration, you know, something uh, something like that that Rav Goren um, had set up. And the idea, and the idea was to do everything that was possible to find and bury the remains of Jewish soldiers who had perished fighting for the land of Israel in, 19, uh, in 1948. Rav Goren, to make a long story short, went on a mission to Janine in his full military uniform with the father of this deceased soldier, a man called Avraham, Avraham Shvat. And I'll just share with you an excerpt from Rav Goren's uh, autobiography, which was translated into English a number of years ago. He says that um, uh, the Jordanians took us in their jeeps and we drove up the hills where the battles had taken place and where there was a chance of finding the bones, even though two years had passed since the battles. We had to enter the suburbs of Janine, and I don't know why, but as we traveled through the steep streets in the open jeep, I was not blindfolded, despite the fact that I was dressed in my IDF colonel's uniform. As the jeep progressed through the streets, a demonstration against me formed, and the Arabs in the streets shouted, Dabet, Dabet, Al Yahud, a Jewish officer, and uh, Itbach Al Yahud, kill the Jews. A few hundred Arabs gathered along the roadside. When the Arab Legion officers saw this, they drew their pistols and began firing into the air. But this had no effect. Only when they started firing over the heads of the demonstrators did the crowd disperse, and we sped through the streets of Janine up into the hills. We were also accompanied by a local sheikh who said he knew exactly where the battles had taken place and where he could find our soldiers' remains. He and another local sheikh refused to climb up the hill with us, claiming it was too steep. But I asked the sheep to bring me some local shepherds who could accompany up the hill. I did. I left the religion officer down below to keep the sheiks occupied with the stories of the Jewish heaven and hell. I went up the hill with the legionnaires and three shepherds who herded their sheep there on a regular basis to my great chagrin. We did not find any soldiers' remains. All we found were animal bones. After an exhausting summer's day of hiking up and down the steep hills in the heat of the day, I returned empty-handed. Mr. Schwat was so disappointed, as were the others with him. We started asking questions, and we contacted a few of the local muhtars and asked them where we might find the bones. One of them told us we should show, he would show us a cave where the bodies had been put. We arranged for him to accompany the legionnaires to meet us the following day at the border. We were afraid that there would be street protests again and therefore decided to circumvent the city rather than driving through it. The Mukhtar said that there was a cave where fallen soldiers from both sides had been taken. I reached the cave and sure enough, skulls, leg bones, all the other bones, 50 skeletons. I had no idea. Were these Arabs? Were these Jews? There was no way to know. Goren took all the remains back with him into Israel. In all likelihood, we only knew of a few Jewish soldiers that were, that were missing. Most, if not all, of these remains probably belonged to Arab soldiers. Rav Goren went to go meet with the Chazon Ish to ask if these, Jew, if these bones could be buried in a Jewish cemetery, and the Chazon Ish said, yes, these bones will be buried in a Jewish cemetery, and the parents of the Jewish soldiers who were searching for their children should know that their children are being put to rest in the land of Israel. There's perhaps no one in, certainly in our generation or the generations uh, past, there is no one quite like Rav Goren who went to the ends of the earth to make sure that every case of May Smith's thought, every Jewish corpse was brought to proper burial in a dignified way in the land of Israel. There were no mountains that he wouldn't move to achieve, to achieve that end. On that note, I'll conclude with one final, with one final thought. The question that, uh, that I want to leave you with and don't worry, we'll try to resolve it, is, is it permissible 
is it permissible to risk one's life to retrieve the body of a fallen soldier? Meis mitzvah, it's so important, the kavod brios and the kavod aretz, the whole halachic world stops turning. Would we even go so far as to say that to perform this mitzvah, to bring to burial a corpse that otherwise will not be buried, can we go so far as to say that one could even endanger one's life? Could a, could a Jewish soldier in the IDF make a dash for it, knowing that there could be a sniper just to, to, to pick up the corpse of his fallen comrade and bring that corpse back to the, to the jeep, to the tank. Is that permissible? Is that allowed? Is that required? What do we say about that, uh, about that case? So the, the truth is, it's a very old story. And if you go back to Shmuel Aleph, and if you have time, you can look in the sources that I've uh, prepared for you. Um, Functionally, that's how Shaul HaMelech was brought to burial. His corpse was, uh, was fought for, and uh, Jewish soldiers had to uh, risk their own lives to retrieve, to retrieve the course of Shaul, of Shaul HaMelech. And on some level, maybe that is the precedent. Maybe that is the basis upon which to, um, to presume that in fact, yes, it is permissible and maybe even required to risk one's life to perform this mitzvah to make sure that everybody of every person or every soldier, as the case may be, is brought to, uh, is brought to bury. I'll share with you a beautiful comment of Rabbi Huda Zoldan, who's a Rosh Hashiva in, uh, in Israel. I'll just summarize it for you. You have it in source number, uh, source number 43. Um, he comes out with a beautiful middle, uh, middle position. And he says, there's, there's certainly no obligation. You can't make a case that there's a chiyuv to risk one's life to bring a Jewish corpse to burial. But he says at the same time, there's certainly no prohibition against doing so. And he said, while it's true that the case of Shaul HaMelech might be sui generis, there is no gainsay the value of what it would mean for soldiers to know that come what may, every member of the IDF will do whatever they possibly can, including risking their lives, to make sure that a fallen comrade will return home. <laughs> If you're talking about soldiers who are defending the Jewish land and the Jewish people, then what an argument there is to be made that one could even endanger one's own life to perform the mitzvah of burying another Jew, of burying a soldier. Shlomo Zalman Orbach was quoted, and I just have it for you in source number 44. I'll share it with you, with you in the English. The damage to the morale of soldiers who see that if they fall, they'll be abandoned is such an important factor in the spirit of the fighting that it therefore constitutes a threat to life. Right? That can't just be uh, you know, uh, put to the side of the conversation. It has to be front and center in the conversation, in the equation weighing whether and to what extent a person may endanger their life to bring another Jew to burial. Now, Rav Goren, as I mentioned, made this such an ethic and such a virtue over the course of his life. He spent years risking life and limb. The Arabs shooting at him in his Jeep in Janine just to bury a, a corpse that had gone missing two years earlier Years he spent risking life and limb to recover the bodies of fallen soldiers and his heroic efforts were nothing short of extraordinary. One could have made the case, and with this I'll conclude, one could have made the case that a soulless body has no inherent value. We understand the sensitivities where surviving relatives are concerned, but why stop the world for someone who leaves no one behind? It's here that the Torah comes along and insists that such a line of thought is profoundly mistaken and may be profoundly un-Jewish. The image of a human being, even one that no longer contains a neshama, is of paramount value. 
To leave a body unburied is to risk profaning either life itself, or as we saw, the land, which is the source of life. And so the halachic world stops turning. Kohen, Nazir, Brismila, Pesach, Megillah, all bets are off. All other religious objectives are suspended. It's not that burial is more important or more valuable per se. We can't know the relative value of mitzvahs. But the consequence of not performing this burial would simply be too dire. It would be an affront to the notion of human life itself, whatever other priorities we might have, simply pale in comparison. Today, we mourn the loss of so many precious Jewish lives throughout our history. How many of them were doubly victimized, murdered by our oppressors, and denied the dignity of proper burial? We mourn their loss and we cry for them. We also take solace from Rav Goren's view of the world and the fact that there are Rav Gorens in the world. Individuals who went to the ends of the earth to protect the sanctity of every person created B'Tselem Elohim both in life and in death. We'll remember too, on this day, the enemies of our people whose actions betray an affront to humanity itself. will cry for the millions of Jewish lives cut short and those that were never given a chance to flourish and we'll commit ourselves to protecting and preserving every image of the divine in our broken world. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, learn with you this Tisha B'Av, and uh, we daven for the day that uh, uh, we'll be dancing in the streets of Yerushalayim in a rebuilt uh, Jerusalem on the 9th of Av. Thank you very much, Rabbi Levine. I'll give you 45 seconds to look at the questions and if you see anything that catches your eye. Otherwise, I do apologize. It's a little bit, uh, or a little bit, pre you know, we want to keep the schedule. We'll have to do the questions another time, but uh, I'll have to have Rabbi Levine back. But if you have anything that uh, we'll give you, you know, anything there that catches your eye, you, you want to address. Okay, just uh, one point here. What about honoring someone's last wishes? So as a general matter, we do honor uh, people's last wishes. Um, for instance, if someone says, don't uh, eulogize me, we do listen. Um, every issue has to be considered on its own uh, merits. Um, there's a lot of issues. Someone says, don't say Kaddish for me. Someone says, don't eulogize me, don't bury me. So on this, on this issue, we do not listen. On this issue, every human being is, uh, uh, is deserving of a Jewish burial, of a dignified and expeditious burial, and uh, there are other uh, last wishes that we may listen to, but not, uh, but not this one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Levine, and uh, look forward to learning with you in the future. We'll take a two minute break, and Sarah Walkenfield, I think is with us, I know she's with us, Director of Education at Safaria, and uh, she'll be starting the, um, their topic is about doubt. Just let me get the exact title, Mourning the Destruction of Doubt. So we're going to start in two minutes. Everybody can, can stretch a little bit and say, hi, Sarah, where, where are you? I don't see you. I am here, uh, okay. technically in Chicago. You're back from Chicago. Yes, she uh, taught my son, took a class of hers in Israel just last week. So uh, it's a nice small world that way. Okay, welcome. We'll, we'll start in a couple minutes. Wonderful. You'll let me know when. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be right back. 